and for this little talk about history and this and what's happening in our streets as uh, statues get toppled and people are questioning our past. And I'm here with Kurt Maida today to record and to present to you a little bit of a discussion on what is happening in our cities as statues and history, according to many people, is being basically revised. Um, and we're here to talk about that today. Uh, Robin, thank you, Robin Lloyd, for being a technician on this broadcast. And this will be recorded today and then broadcast later on Channel 17 CC TV. Okay, as I said, I'm here with Kurt Maida, who is an attorney and, uh, and a historian, aficionado, and I am also, neither one of us are uh, what we would call scholars in that regard. However, we are amateur historians and both of us have taught history for many years. Okay, so Kurt, what's going on do you think with all this news of statues being toppled and history being reconsidered? Okay, Sandy, uh, good to see you again. Uh, hopefully live next time. But yes. uh, the, uh, just to give people a little bit of context about the term statue toppling, so what's, you know, aside from the, the big story of coronavirus, which we can't escape in our, in our country these days or the world, the other uh, parallel story that's developed uh, about a month after the lockdowns were the protests through much of our country uh, in response to the killing of a, uh, a black man by the Minneapolis police. Uh, following an arrest and the excessive use of force, the alleged ex excessive use of force against this man, uh, his name was George Floyd, uh, the police officers, plural in question, uh, placed a, uh, a rather uh, cruel chokehold and they also placed their knee on his neck to which Mr. Floyd, the deceased, uh, responded with the statement that he couldn't breathe, that I can't breathe. And the use of force continued uh, by the officer, officers who were on the scene for, again, what was deemed a, a, as a nonviolent alleged crime. I think the f crime was forgery. Something uh, like that or counterfeiting or something, yes. Right, right. But it was, it was not in response to an, an emergent matter which involved really, you know, an excessive use of force, you know, nor were there victims of violence on the scene, aside from, you know, Mr. Floyd. Right. Uh, the, the killing was, uh, and I'm calling it that, the killing was videotaped uh, by a, a few different bystanders through, you know, our new uh, technology that's developed over the years, the use of, you know, video recording through cell phones. Uh, smartphones, and it was recorded from a couple of different angles, and there was really no uh, news or information that came out that provided a counter narrative from the police indicating that the use of force, the, the amount of the force that was applied to Mr. Floyd was necessary to subdue Mr. Floyd. Uh, there, there, Mr. Floyd was, was not armed. Uh, he, again, as Sandy mentioned, uh, he, the, the, uh, the use of force was not in response to a violent crime that he committed. Uh, and, uh, un un unfortunately, uh, this man died as a result. And what happened around the country after this, these videos went viral, meaning, uh, became, uh, uh, spread all over the internet by people, uh, there was a great deal of anger, not only in the African-American communities uh, around the country, but uh, this time around also uh, many people of, uh, that are white as well as of other colors also joined in the outrage uh, against this excessive use of force against Mr. Floyd. And it uh, this, you know, illustrated a pattern that's been going on uh, in our country for, for many years. And this pattern has been recently exposed through the uh, use of uh, cell phones that have proliferated through our, uh, through our country and the world and are now being recorded, where in the past, there was always a counter narrative that was often uh, provided by law enforcement. And now with the videotape rolling, 
uh, it's very difficult to provide a counter narrative when much of it's on film. Mm -hmm. And it, in some cases, it contradicts what police officers have said in some cases uh, that have justified the use of force that eventually led to, to deaths in many cases of these unarmed, mostly black men, but in some cases, black women and children also. Also, uh, white, so, white, white men too in this state. Yes, In this sure. state, but that is not being paid uh, attention to right now. Particularly, I think you're right, that it's the whole racial component that has caused such mass attention and then outrage. Right, and, and then the other part of it is uh, often what's happened is uh, when these cases, when they have gone to trial against some of these police officers, uh, the juries have exonerated them and they've been right. let go. Right. Uh, and the police officers have often used this thin blue line theory to justify the, uh, the use of force in some of these cases and that this thin blue line is essentially the, 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 the threshold between you know, chaos in our society and law and order. Right. And often these mostly men have uh, been exonerated in these cases and that has resulted in protests. And there's also been further introspection in addition to the protests specifically for Mr. Floyd is uh, one of the targets have been statues, some of them Confederate, some yep. of them not necessarily Confederate. Even it's even extended to some of the founding fathers of this country that have you know that were instrumental in the formation of the Republic, uh, as well as other people, people of commerce, right. people uh, in the arts, who at the time when they were alive uh, held racist views, uh, expressed racist views, or did things that were that are deemed now as being racist. And as a result, what's happened as, is uh, people have taken action against works of art as well wow. as statues that represent most these mostly men, but in sometime, some cases women, uh, that have been honored in public parks, city wow. squares, uh, and other parts of our country. Uh, and what we're talking about today is whether or not these works of art and or statues should all come down or not. And Sandy and I, and you know, t and to some extent Robin today, will talk about that and whether or not that is the path that we should follow culturally speaking, as well as in terms of you know, honoring the, well, if you wanna use the term honoring or at least observing aspects of our country's history as well as its art. Right, well, Robin had a report for us, right, Robin? Yeah, uh, Robin had a report about uh, something that's local to Vermonters, right, right. and Vermont, I think that's important if uh, Robin just wants to give us a little bit of yeah. context uh, about what that's about and then tell us what's going on. Right, about the law school, right, Robin? Yeah, um, so uh, I want to talk about, and I think I can put this up on the screen, perhaps, um, if I can figure that out. Hold on a moment. Share screen. Yeah, here we go. Uh, and I'm talking about the mural by Sam Curson, who uh, painted this mural. Can you see it? Yes. yes. Very, very uh, beautiful. I hadn't seen it before. Thank yeah. you. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm impressed, Robin, that you were able to do that. I, I couldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> a few buttons to push. Um, yeah. The mural was created by Sam Kirsten for the Vermont Law School in 1993. And uh, I went down there, I know Sam, and um, I thought this was, you know, a fascinating project. Yeah. He did a lot of research on it. And what the title of it is, The Underground Railroad, Vermont and the Fugitive Slave. Now, uh, this panel that you're looking at is just half of it. It is the panel of uh, the of slavery and and um, you know African-American people in condition well you can see on the far left yeah. slavery now we'll see if we can see there's a close-up uh, and um, the the other half of it is of really Vermont history 
and um, of which this one picture, which is a little bit hard to read, can yeah. you? Uh, let me get a close up of that. This is of um, uh, white people ha helping slaves um, through the Underground Railroad, and you can see the um, uh, state house in the distance there. And so they are on their way to Canada, I think. Yeah. And this is just one image there. So, um, and, and Robin, if I can just briefly interrupt, one of the things that I'd like to, uh, and it, you know, it'll help with the context of the conversation. The picture that you have up right now, uh, the one thing that I'm seeing on the left, there's a, a, I'm assuming a black woman wearing a blue dress on her knees, and uh -huh. it appears as if she's praying. Uh huh. Uh, you know, and I'll, I'll I just want to bring that to people's attention. Uh, and we'll talk about it in a moment. So yeah, continue, Rob, please, Robin. Sorry yeah. that I interrupted. Yeah. Okay. Um, now I'm. Now where am I? <laughs> uh, are you seeing? Because uh, no. I. I think we should go back to the wait. original. Wait. There we are, aren't we? No. No, I'm seeing oh. your computer screen with all I of your applications. Oh. Okay. Stop. Stop share. Here we go. There yeah. we. Are. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, well, let me just read you some of the comments that have been made about this. Uh, it was protested um, by a few students at the, at the uh, Vermont Law School, and, um, and they were listened to, and so the decision has been to uh, paint over it. It's, oh, oh. it's not It's not a mural on panels that can be moved. It's painted there. So how will one be able to move it? That will be very difficult. I think Sam is wondering about that. Uh, but let me just read a few comments made from that. I, I'm sure uh, Sam asked uh, Mike Alowitz to make these, uh, to respond to these um, request that the mural be taken down. Uh, Mike Alowitz is a uh, uh, eminent American muralist and his comment was that one one reason cited for taking it down, the figures were painted in greens. Apparently these custodians of propriety are unaware that great artists like Marc Chagall and Pablo Picasso also painted green okay. figures. Should their work be destroyed as well? also cited the over-exaggeration of figures. Again, apparently the aspiring artists and school administrators are unaware that great African-American muralists, right. as stylistically diverse as Robert Colescott, Romaine Bearden, Faith Ringgold, and others, distorted the human figure. Authoritarian re regimes often demand that art be realistic, most famously demonstrated by the 1937 Degenerate Art Exhibition organized by the Nazi Party. Why such animosity to modernist or, or, or abstraction? Because it encourages people to think criti critically. So uh, a number of people have spoken out in support of, of Sam, I have. Mm -hmm. uh, we're realizing that, you know, in a way we're going against the, the trend. I did get some serious pushback from friends saying, uh, you know, uh, people of color are the ones that need to determine what is offensive. And you white people are not the ones that uh, should be in the way of those determinations. Um, and, uh, you know, my thought about it all is that there just needs to be more discussion. That's the whole point of it. Use this as a learning experience. Use a mural, but you also use the opposition to the mural. Now, the problem is the school is closed uh, at the moment. The Vermont Law School is not in session, and, uh, and yet the owners have given, I mean, the uh, administration have given Sam Kirsten, uh, uh, what was it, 30 days or 60 days 
to figure out a way to move it. And so there has not been a discussion. Uh, I would like to point out to people, and I'm not quite sure wh where you can find it, but I did find it earlier. Uh, the video I did, which is 24 minutes long, where Sam is looking at each panel and describing what it represents. I mean, his style of art is a kind of coloristic um, uh, Mexican style of, of muralism. But, and so I do think it, it needs explanation. And I don't know whether that um, film and explanation was available to the students or whether um, they were able to walk through it with Sam Kirsten and maybe understand it more. I just think more, um, more um, communication needed to happen in this case. So I don't know really what's going to happen at the moment. Um, whether it will truly be taken down. Sam is trying to get people um, together to complain and I have written a letter, but that's how it stands now. I think some of the things like in terms of the critiques uh, that uh, some of the students of color had, I, I, I don't, I, I think there's a consensus that uh, when the mural was put up that you know his intention was not to uh, portray a racist point of view. I, I, I'm pretty sure most people think that, you know, he had the best interests at heart when that mural was created. The objections were to the, number one, the portrayal of the, uh, the African portion of the, uh, the, uh, the, the mural as the, the, uh, the individuals were portrayed largely, you know, appearing in our current, um, uh, what, what our current idea would be of a savage. Uh, and, and then moving on to the African-American phase from, you know, moving from Africa, that uh, some of the black characters were created with exaggerated uh, lips, uh, you know, and other body uh, areas that were excessively, you know, exaggerated in, 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 in the spirit of Sam's art. Uh, and then there was a, a, the other critique was that there was a white savior complex that was also being illustrated in the picture that, you know, and I pointed out that woman, uh, the black woman on her knees praying, mm -hmm. essentially thanking the, the, the nice white people for saving them for, from a, uh, from a, a, you know, a future of destitution and slavery. So, I mean, those were some of the critiques. However, you know, uh, the question here is, you know, uh, who are we to question, you know, art? I mean, the, if everyone is allowed to have a point of view uh, about what offends them, you know, we talked a little bit about this when we tried to give this a shot last week, you know, are, you know, are tra travelers that happen to be Jewish that go to Egypt, can they demand the removal of the pyramids and the statues of Ramses? because these, uh, many of these buildings and, and artifacts were created by slavery, many of which were Jews at the time. Uh, I mean, as someone who is, uh, you know, whose family comes from India, I don't really have a feeling of love when I see a big statue of Winston Churchill. He wasn't a fan of, he wouldn't have been a fan of me and I wasn't a fan of him. However, I don't know that his statue needs to come down uh, in in squares in London, because you know I'm somehow bothered because there's another side to him also that was instrumental in prevailing in the in the war against the Nazis during the Second World War. So I mean I think I can separate some of the ideas from some of the flaws that these people have, and I think that's really important. Otherwise, there's no end to you know really destroying a lot of this art and in many cases, statues. If we're gonna look at every single element of uh, the, these people's long, in many cases, long lives and critique them. I think that Robin, I think there are actually two points and Robin brought up one and what I think you're doing, Curtis, bringing up another, I'm not certain, they're connected, but they're kind of separate. One, what Robin said that is really disturbing to me is that what some people are arguing is that white people don't have any authority to judge art. 
um, and uh, or, or to or, or create or or create it and portray people of right, color, right, right, which, ridic which is ridiculous. Well, it's really, really dangerous. This is a yeah. this is art. This isn't a political tract that this no. guy did, and it's very beautiful. Should anybody have the right to paint it over? I mean, it, it seems a, a real travesty to the art of that man. Um, regardless of what it is, would you, for instance, paint over Picasso because it shows people in, in various degrees of misalignment even, heads here and legs here? That's also probably a deformation of the human body. But would you paint it over? Would you paint over any artist? That's his art. It just seems to me terrible. It seems to me a tragedy. Well, I went to uh, I went to Rome about 20 years ago, and mm -hmm. I got a tour of the area of Rome called the Forum. Yeah, which was where uh, yeah, amazing, amazing place. But you know, one of the things that the guides told us was once Christianity became the original, I mean, the the uh, the official religion of the state of the Roman Empire in the in the 300s, what they attempted to do was to either destroy or take apart any uh, element of pre-Christian religion. Right. And that meant taking down buildings, painting over frescoes that were created with, you know, with images of Minerva and Jupiter. Right. Uh, and, you know, and I thought there was a real loss in the fact that absolutely. that was a real, an absolutely amazing place. And many of the buildings were taken down, not because of age, but because of the fact that they were considered offensive and, uh, you know, and uh, honoring polytheistic themes, mm -hmm. which were offensive at the time when, you know, when Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire. Right. But the second point, so I think we have one point, do you destroy another person's art? And I really find that totally problematic. But there's another thing that Robin also said, that some of these students are arguing that white people cannot participate or judge art because this is all, only black people can criticize art. Is that well, what you're no, well, I, no, I mean, I think the other Robin, part of it- Robin, Robin, Robin's trying to that. Okay, go ahead, Robin. Friends who responded to my letter and yeah. said that uh, you really have to find out more what their problem is, you need to talk to them. You can't just call it a travesty, which is what I did in the letter. Uh, and uh, you, as a white person, without um, understanding where they're coming from, and you know, I can agree with that. I think that's exactly what needs to happen: is a a, a, a broader discussion. And Sandy, that's exactly what isn't happening these days. Yeah, right. So, outraged about it that we can't come together and that we can't have a hearing down at Vermont Law School or in um, South Royalton and different opinions can be expressed and understandings and so on. Uh, it all happens, you know, on the internet and it's, you know, you don't get to conclusion to the conclusion of things. I think you make a great point, Robin. I mean, the conversation is a really important piece. Exactly. R rather than getting these, you know, anonymous tweets on Twitter and anonymous emails, you know, I mean, I think, you know, a community forum where people have a chance to uh, talk about uh, their points of view and be challenged in some right. cases, you know, uh, about that is, I think that's really important. But rather than, you know, responding to a bunch of Twitter comments, and, and taking down this man's uh, painting, uh, who, again, there was a consensus even amongst the students of color that his intentions were honorable when he created that. It was not to create some kind of a racist uh, image, you know, yeah. at, at Vermont Law School. That, that's actually a given. They've stipulated to that, but they just don't think that a 1990 or 1994 image is, um, is acceptable in 2020. And then the other part of it is partly what Sandy and both you, Robin, have mentioned, that whether or not you know, white people have the right to quote unquote, you know, a big term that you hear these days is cultural appropriation, have any right to represent a person of color. Mm -hmm. You know, so, okay. I, so, so you can't, you know, so you can't draw a person who's black unless the artist is black. 
Okay, now Kurt, uh, Sam Curson did enormous amount of research uh, into the history of the fugitive slave in Vermont, and uh, and, he, and he worked in consultation, I think, with a, a notable person of color mm -hmm. at the time when the mural was put up, who at the time, and I think she's still around today, essentially gave her blessing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So maybe a, maybe a Zoom call could happen where uh, the various groups would at least speak together and explain their thoughts. It, that would be terrific, but that's been one of my real uh, complaints about the whole COVID era is that live debates, live discussions simply cannot happen. And there's no reason why they couldn't happen if you properly socially distanced I don't get it. I don't get I mean, it. We had, a, we had a pretty nice summer here in Vermont. Yeah, we could have had this conversation outside. Yeah, yeah no, I don't. And we could have filmed it or we could sure. have had the debate. Robin, you and I did many debates at Burlington College on many controversial mm -hmm. subjects, and they always ended up at least good naturedly. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't understand why so much of our public spaces are shut down and that you cannot have face-to-face -face discussions about anything. So I'm going to continue to pressure about that. City Hall is shut down. You mm -hmm. know, before, before Black Lives Matter even painted that, uh, even on um, Main Street in Burlington, there should have been, I think, a discussion about it because there were a lot of, not for me, but there were bad feelings that were left because all of that was done behind closed doors. I just, I can't tell you how much I long to return to live debates and live discussions. But I did want to mention the second point, because I don't think that art should be censored, honestly. That's the work of an artist. That's like his, he was expressing his soul and his research. I really hope they do not paint it over. I don't, that's like painting over an individual human being to me. Mm. I mean, it's one thing if it had to be moved, but if it can't be moved, would anybody really wanted it to be painted over? It's very beautiful besides. Mm -hmm. no. So um, and the other problem is that the artist lives in Canada now. So if there was to be uh, a, a, a group meeting, he would not be able to come down, but there could be a Zoom meeting. So I'm going to prepare. Sure. Yeah, that'd be great. But look at Robin. That's another, of course, whole problem. All of our borders are shut for, to every, to the whole world. Americans can't go anywhere because of COVID. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of ways that we cannot even have society at this point at all. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, but, but the other point was that, as Kurt and I have talked about, in a way, there's a second point. There's the censorship of art and the appropriation of that artist's work, which I really find terribly, terribly offensive because when you make a piece of art, as you know, Robin, you've done a lot more of that than I have. It's like you're, you're expressing your soul, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so to erase it is like erasing Robin. Mm -hmm. Well, someone said to me that maybe your my, the film that I made called Black Dawn, which was... Yeah about the people of Haiti rising up against the, the French colonists, that it portrays the people uh, as sort of black sambos. And the point is, yeah. Uh, and I think that was one of the criticisms regarding this mural too. Uh, and, but, but in my case, I think I'm okay because those paintings were created by black uh, Haitians. They were the artists of Haiti who, that's that's the way they paint. They um, right kind of a folkloric art, and so that art that got used in the film it's a folkloric image of the history of Haiti. So I th I think I'm safe. I certainly yeah. hope so because it's a beautiful film, and it's again it's your and it was also produced by Doreen Craft. And yeah, art, yeah, and it's yeah. and it was a a great. First of all, who knows anything about Haiti except you? in this country. Um, and I used to show that film in my classes because mm -hmm. no one knows a thing about Haiti and it's instructive, which gets me to my second point. You destroy murals like that, you destroy your film, I hope it doesn't happen, and you are destroying history. And if there's anything that's needed at this time, it's history. I, I can't imagine, like these, the, the recent statue, I mean, all these Confederate statues were torn down, but there were statues that were not of the Confederates that were torn down, one of being one of being Christopher Columbus. Why was that torn down? I mean, I guess I understand a little 
that maybe people shouldn't be put in the public square as if they're totally honorable people or that we should honor them, mm -hmm. but we could use them to mm -hmm. teach history is what I'm talking about. Isn't it, isn't it true that in the Soviet Union, they, yeah. when it became Russia, they moved many of the statues of uh, Lenin and, uh, and Marx too, I guess, to a certain garden where you can go there and watch and look at all these statues and think, I, but they didn't. Not, yeah, they probably got torn down. I, I, I mean, I think in the moment of, of, of fury of, um, of outrage that happened here in this country that things happened, and to my mind, it was okay. It was in in the moment of passion, but this should not be the way in which. Uh, we now proceed in terms of all all objects of art and yeah, especially never you know, in terms as, of object of art, never. Right, I, I, never. Uh, but it's different if you have a statue of Robert E. Lee in the middle of a square where offends you know a huge minority of people like black people. But, but I, don't, know, I still why why isn't it just moved? But Sandy, I don't. Uh, I mean, I I think. Look, I, you know, I think, uh, you know, what you mentioned regarding the importance of the historical nature of these statues and the times when they were put up, uh, I think you can create a teaching moment also. Yeah. I, I, I'm certainly not against putting up a plaque, you know, next to the current you know, plaque that may have been there either from the 19, um, the 1860s or the 1960s regarding Robert E. Lee mm -hmm. and put something up that is current and states, you know, well, what did Mr. Lee's policies, you know, in terms of what he was fighting for, right. what did that really mean? You know, he was trying to pres help uh, preserve a system that subjugated, a, 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 you know, a large portion of people and, uh, you know, resulted in deaths, rapes, et cetera, et cetera, uh, of, of the subjugated class. And their, you know, uh, forebears at this point, you know, are, are fellow citizens. In this country so you can certainly provide plaques or you know what put a statue of someone that you like next to the statue of robert e yeah. lee put up a statue of you know frederick douglas or another great person like that right um but use it as a teaching moment don't you know erase history you know i i mean when we tried to do this program la a, a week ago i brought up the fact that how americans of all colors and stripes and political thoughts were really deeply offended, regardless of the fact that they don't follow that religion, but by the Taliban destroying these 3,000 year old statues, you know, that were practically the size of the Statue of Liberty, the statues themselves of the Buddha, when yeah, that right. part of the world was actually Buddhist. Uh, and by destroying, you know, these ancient relics and these artifacts, you know, I, I think humanity is losing something in the process. Exactly, exactly. For instance, I don't understand why, I mean, I, as I said, I can understand having certain of these statues in places of honor, if that's what you want to call public squares, but I don't understand why they would have to be destroyed or why Christopher Columbus had to be decapitated. Um, I, I was, I actually personally was really horrified, probably because I'm a historian, because you can find the opposite view for any of these people, probably even including Robert E. Lee. Um, at, you know, you can, and it's a good thing to do a balanced kind of history lesson to people who are coming up. Okay, I'm not certain that many of these statue topplers know anything about history. Didn't they want to destroy a statue of uh, Abraham Lincoln? Wasn't it having his hand out to a slave who was in chain? And yeah, that the, they the, were, and, right. And, the and that that statue had been paid for by emancipated slaves and by Frederick Douglass. What on earth are they doing? I'll bet you, I had discussions with people who didn't in this country who don't know who Frederick Douglass is. I mean, you know, look. They, 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 they simply don't know US history and doing all this to the statues doesn't help. Like, I, bet you, I bet you that most pe many people don't know what the Confederacy was. Like any protest movement, like any uh, situation where people gather and there's occasional acts of violence, you know, you're gonna have a certain percentage of people that are out there, a small percentage, but there, like in any situation, where they're enjoying the chaos. I mean, I think in Washington, Washington DC, they toppled the statue of Mahatma Gandhi. They did? Know? They did, right. They so, he was. I don't know, but I, I don't think they knew. 
Yeah, right. You know? Exactly. So, exactly. I mean, you know, and uh, in many cases, I think, you know, with, with respect to some of the people whose statues have been toppled, uh, I'm sure there were people that were just out to, sta to topple a statue and there was no political aim that they were trying to reach or achieve, but it was for the sake of the chaos. Right. Mm -hmm. right. I, I'd like to bring up uh, use of... Uh, use of words and how words change. Um, the associate director of the Peace and Justice Center had an article about the, uh, about the acronym BIPOC. So that is Black, Indigenous, and People of Color. Now, prior to reading that article, I thought People of Color covered Black and Indigenous people. But no, she says, and I, have to agree with her because she knows that black people don't necessarily feel included with, under people of color, nor do indigenous people. That which means that people of color refers, I guess, mainly to Lat Latinx people. Um, so now that's why you see in papers nowadays be. B I P O C. The question is, I don't know how you pronounce that uh, verbally. B Pac. B Pac. Yeah. And I don't know. A little more awkward to say, but uh, that's that's the way it's going. Well, but I don't get her authority. Where's her authority? I well, mean, who says? Who says that she she has the right to change names? And who says? She's not changing anything. She's commenting on on uh, the trend that she's seen it in right. in the black and and uh, people of color community, and she, as a woman of color, is uh, tuned into that. Oh, I don't know any. Is, is oh, anyway, we'll get to that later. But in other words, there's a certain degree also of political correctness that is stalking the country, which I don't really necessarily think is a great political development. I think it ignores the fact, by making everybody a victim, by making everybody special, we're ignoring the fact that, that for instance, that there's a great struggle really going on in this country between the rich and the poor. Um, and Bernie Sanders has pointed that out over and over. Not that he's any great saint or anything, but, but that the real thing that's going on in the country is that many, many people are desperately poor and that few people are fabulously rich. In other words, we're ignoring the ways that in which we are united a lot against an oppressive system. You can point out the singularities of black people or indigenous people or gay people or women, but it ignores the fact that at this moment in history, what is really going on is, a, I think, is a class war between all of us on the bottom and the very few people on the top. And that to me, that to me is a revolutionary struggle, which I'm not certain that uh, identity politics get you anywhere, really. Yeah, I think the identity politics is really a convenient, excessive focus on semantics without actually improving anyone's life. Right, right. That, on, that's on, sort a, of on, a, on, on a day to day basis. But I think that if you say that publicly, you might get in a lot of trouble. But here we are. Maybe, maybe, it may be easier for me to say than to you. Why? Well, I'm a woman. You, yeah, oh, that's true. Yeah. And an old woman. Uh, you talk about oppression. Right. <laughs> Who of the entire population is more oppressed, more marginalized than old women? Give me a break. But nobody likes to remind anybody that they're a <laughs> woman either. But I'm saying it deliberately because that's true. I mean, that is true everywhere. The old are the most marginalized and really the most oppressed. They're right now locked down in nursing homes and they're not able to even see their families. Remember that. And are you saying that uh, old men are not marginalized? Or no, they, they are. They are. Of course they are, but not as much as old women. Uh -huh. Old men, like look at Joe Biden, you know, he's running for president of the United States and he probably doesn't have all his wits together. He, he might be the next president. You think an old woman with dementia could do that? No. I don't know. Or a young woman without it. Yeah, right. What? We only have five more minutes to our hour. All so, right. 
if so getting back to history, I'm, I'm just going to br uh, briefly mention that we're in dangerous territory when we're erasing history. I was in the Soviet Union twice, and I was in the Lenin Library once, um, and uh, noting the portraits of the founding fathers of the Soviet Union, Stalin and Lenin and Trotsky. However, Trotsky was airbrushed out of that portrait. Is that a good idea? Trotsky was a huge contributor to the founding of the Soviet Union and international communism everywhere. We might not like it. They don't like it, apparently, or Joe Stalin didn't like it, and he was assassinated eventually. But should he be airbrushed out of the enormous part that he played in the Russian Revolution? I don't think so. I don't want to get to that point. Let me, let's finish about Jefferson, because I think that is the most interesting point. They all wanted to topple Jefferson. So what do you think about that? What do we think about toppling a man like Jefferson or even Washington because they were slave owners? Yeah, again, I mean, I think, you know, my original point was where does this end? You know, are we trying to find a chaste Superman statue to, you know, honor? Because all, all these people had flaws, you know, if we continue to go. And honestly, you know, Look, at the beginning, when, when Charlottesville was about to happen, the protests there that turned into, you know, mayhem uh, and a white supremacy rally, uh, there, was discuss there were discussions about the removal of those Confederate statues prior to that protest. And the president, Trump, jumped in and he said that, okay, you know, where does this end? You know, because the, he said himself that the founding fathers, you know, these guys were not saints by any stretch of the imagination, especially judged, you know, by the people of the present, you know. So, yeah, all these people had slaves. Uh, yeah, it was known that Jefferson had slaves beaten. It was known that Jefferson actually, because he was literate, used to write up ads to mm -hmm. capture escaped slaves. And it was known that he slept with slaves. Yeah, a lot that, of kids that, with Sally Hemings, actually. Right, and, and Sally right. was 14 when he was right, 50. Right. It, it wasn't a beautiful, two, you know, beautiful 18-year-olds falling in love and having a, a wonderful interracial relationship. You know, so there was a tremendous, a huge difference in power in that relationship. So, yeah, yes, these were flawed men, but I think at the end of the day, 200, 225 years later, we need to be able to separate the message from the messenger. And at the same oh, point, okay. Jefferson wrote the, uh, the Declaration of Independence, and he did contribute significantly to the founding of this country. Yet he was a flawed man personally. Well, he was deeply flawed, and so was Washington. In fact, Jefferson probably yeah. more than Washington, because Washington emancipated his slaves. But Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence after all, that all men are created equal. Those men also did not choose monarchy. They chose to have a republic, as you recall, and get rid of a monarchy. They formed the basis of a republic. Those things should be taught as, yeah, so well, as well as the fact that he had sex with a 14-year-old slave and, and produced slaves that he did not emancipate. Yeah. And so he was a real, a real problem, that guy. But we're, but we're still trying to live up to the ideals yeah. that his documents described. And, you know, he wasn't good enough to live up to his own ideals, but mm -hmm. he was able to eloquently express them. And these are, you know, guiding and founding principles of this country. I whether, know. We whether we like it or not. I do like it. I like it yeah. that those are ideals. I'm, I'm right. sorry about this. I can't turn it off. I'm sorry. But anyway, any final comments, Robin? Uh, no, I think this was a very interesting conversation, and uh, thank you for it. Wait a minute, I want to remind you to try to get that discussion about the mural. That would be terrific. Mm -hmm. Okay. That would be terrific, and I'd love to participate in that. I found it, and I'm so happy you had it here, Robin, because it's very beautiful. Yes. Okay. Very beautiful. All right, thank you. And, thank uh, you. We'll see you. Kurt, I hope to see you on Friday. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, everyone. But thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.